Bill Shorten, good morning. Welcome. Good morning, Barry. As a trade union leader, did you ever rip off your workers to benefit the union? In, in other words, did you trade away terms and conditions in exchange for direct payments to the union? No, never. I've spent my whole working life standing up for workers. Didn't matter if it was the two trapped miners at Beaconsfield or professional network, netballers or indeed uh, factory workers or construction workers. I'll put my record up and the record of the Australian trade union movement up against Tony Abbott's any day of the week. Mr Abbott seems to think that people forget that he was the Minister for Work Choices. The whole time I was a union leader, we had to put up with John Howard and Tony Abbott attacking workers' conditions. I'm proud of being a moderate trade union official, working cooperatively between employees and employers. I'm interested in better wages for workers, better safety, job security, and profitable companies. Because I understand that if you get cooperation in the workplace, everyone wins. It's not just Tony Abbott saying it, but <coughs> the Fairfax, uh, you know, Saturday editorial or Fairfax papers say that uh, based on the evidence uh, before the Royal Commission, you manipulated the system in pursuit of personal power. What I've done as a union leader and what literally thousands of other union representatives do is make sure that we have cooperation in the workplace. What I get is that where employees are well treated, employers do well. What I also understand is that where employers are able to make a dollar, make a profit, be competitive, compete with the rest of the world, then they can keep employing employees. See, when Tony Abbott got elected into Parliament and some of his team, it was the mid-90s, they didn't even know what enterprise bargaining was. I'm a modern, I was a modern trade union leader in that we knew that the old centralised system had ended. Hawke and Keating and Kelty had said that we needed to put the focus on the enterprise. I'm proud of my record of negotiating agreements representing people and making sure that both employers and employees could get the best out of going to work every day. Well, let's look at some of the detail as to why these allegations arise and why people are making those sorts of judgments. And let's look at the case of Tees John Holland. Now, it goes yeah. back about 10 years or so. According to evidence, the company paid your union $300,000 as part of the Eastlink project. Why would they do that? Well, let's talk about the evidence. Eastlink was the biggest construction project, biggest road ever built in Australia. I sat down and negotiated with uh, Connect East and the builders to negotiate the best pay rates that civil construction workers had ever earned in Australia. Uh, what we did, though, is that we gave them some flexibility. And I, I, I know the detail may be a bit sort of long, but it's important because it's at the heart of this debate. In the building industry, as opposed to civil construction, there were 26 fixed RDOs each year. Now on a civil road project where you've got multi-million dollar road borers, tunnel borers, heavy equipment, I formed the view that you'd have 13 fixed RDOs and 13 floating RDOs, in other words taken at a time which wasn't going to shut the whole two and a half billion, three billion dollar project down. Now that, that was in return for the best construction rates we've seen. The job finished ahead of time which saved the taxpayer money. Uh, the, the pay rates, the, the sort of average figure, and Tony Shepherd, who's not normally a friend of Labor's, come out and said, actually, um, the job blokes were getting about $150,000 a year 10 years ago, and it changed the model of construction, civil projects in Victoria. Now, what we've been attacked for is that Thies John Holland um, uh, paid for training of our delegates, paid for health and safety. You know, th this is not unusual in the construction industry. The real issue here is that somehow a company working with a union in the best interests of employees and the project is somehow suspicious. There's an almost a reverse class war analysis going on. Because I'm a modern bloke trying to get uh, cooperation, not confrontation, mm -hmm. you know, people are saying that is the, the but, wrong but it way goes to go. But again, the, 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 the money that the, the company paid directly to the union, you're saying that was for health and safety and for training. Why, why is that in their interest to do that? Why, why wouldn't the union pick up the bill for that? Well, we do this every day, you're quite right. But when John Howard came into power in 1996, he reversed all the efforts of the ACTU and previous governments to build more cooperative workplace. What really matters in a workplace, what helps an employer if you've got a unionised workforce, is if your shop stewards know the rules of the game. If your safety reps are taught to be able to examine situations to make sure the workplace is more safety, better informed delegates, better workplace safety saves companies money. Unions are very good at safety. We are good at teaching delegates how to resolve disputes. 
So I think this is what's, what's happening is, um, and perhaps it's a perverse compliment, that Tony Abbott's commissioned a, a, a royal commission and they're sort of having a look at all my pre-parliamentary work experience. But you know, I think sometimes uh, some of the critics say, oh, this is all bad for myself and for Labor. You know, I think it demonstrates why the Labor Party's got a better vision for the future. Because we're not into dividing the joint. We're not into dividing worker versus, gov uh, worker versus uh, employer. It, it, the, the, the almost hysterical attacks this week in Parliament on a range of issues show the government is not happy unless they have got a model of industrial relations which says that unless workers and unions are at the throat of companies and vice versa, that something's wrong. That couldn't be a worse description of the future for Australian workers. All right, well, let's look at what happened with Winslow Constructions, and this goes back to 2005, and they paid the union dues, this is the evidence, they paid union dues um, of some 105 members of your union at a cost of $38,000. What do you know about that? Well, first of all, when I look at and hear all this detail, this is why I've asked the Royal Commission to bring the hearing forward. I can't go to every bit of evidence and every document which I don't have in my possession. So what I've done is I've asked the Royal Commission, I want to come and present and you ask all the questions you want. What I've also asked the Royal Commission now is that please provide me with all the documents you have. There are tens of thousands of documents. Wait, you can't remember whether this well, was done? You know, it would be foolish of me to try and say categorically on every individual transaction what's happened, is it X or is it Y, but what I can say unequivocally unequivocally, is as a union leader, I always wanted engaged members. As a union leader, I always did my absolute best from when I got up to when I went to bed every day, working out how do I get better conditions for workers. And again, when we talk about some of the examples in construction, which is what you've just raised, mm -hmm. there seems to be some suspicion in some elements of uh, parts of the media and also the government that somehow when a company works with a pragmatic modern union, that this is a bad thing. I don't agree sure. with that. Do you, do you, you must, though, recall whether at any point companies paid union fees. Well, certainly companies would collect payroll deduction. You know, people pay their union fees and the company takes out their pay and pays it. My preference is always that employees... No, we're not talking about no, that. We're I'm talking coming... here about the companies actually picking up the bill. No, I'm coming to that. So I'm just telling you what my preference is. My preference is that employees pay their union dues, but what I also get is that I'd rather someone be in the union than not in the union. When we get further into the detail of particular transactions, I th would be foolish of me to simply say with um, yes or no to every question. What I need is the same documentation that the Royal Commission has. But again, what I reiterate is that I'm proud of my record as a union leader. When I started work at the AW, it wasn't going so no, well. No, but you do accept, though, that at some point companies would have paid the union fees. It's entirely possible, but what I don't know is it wasn't the practice of the union as its preferred model. And furthermore, I don't have at my hands all of the detail of all of the claims being put to me. But I am 100% relaxed about my record. Ben Davis, who's now running the union in Victoria, says that it's, that sort of practice is, uh, it profoundly weakens power in the workplace. Do you concede that? Do you agree with him on that? Well, what I believe is that the more engaged union members are in their union, the better outcomes you get for members. But what I also recognise is that if you look at the record that I had when I started at the AW to when I left the AW, we were in much better shape. We had uh, more active members. I've spent a lot of time training our delegates. One of the untold stories of the union is that I put over 100 delegates through TAFE training in health and safety and also in terms of human resource management. I know that under my leadership, union conditions for members raised and we also were able to help companies ensure that they were profitable and that people had job security and yep. that they were safer. But you know what's implied by that is, is that you trade away perhaps a wage increase so that their union fees are paid and then that in turn increases your power base. Well, that is not true. And I've never ever, and I go back to the answer I gave to you at the start of this interview, never ever not put the interests of members first and I've got a record of working in the union that does it. And again, I'd say the underlying assumption in all of this, the argument that somehow the, the hypothesis you advance is true, is where you've got companies working with unions. Modern Australian trade unionism, and the unionist that I am, doesn't rely on a class war view that somehow that the interests of employees and managers are in two separate spheres and they're irreconcilable. I believe that when people can go to work and be happy, satisfied, engaged, 
where the employer is getting employees who feel their interests are aligned with the employer, you get productivity. This is the future of Australian workplaces. It is a future which I know I helped work on when I was at the union, and I am entirely confident. And all the people who've worked with me, and all of the members who've worked directly with me, they, they know this. Anyone who knows me knows how absolutely committed I am to putting the interests of workers first. And when I hear Tony Abbott say that somehow he's got a better record on workers, do you know no Liberal government's ever supported a serious increase in the minimum wage? What uh, is your view then of the way the Royal Commission is going about its business? Well, I always said that the Royal Commission, set up by Tony Abbott to investigate unions, would be an opportunity for people to settle scores. I always expected that my record would be examined. I offer myself as the alternative Prime Minister of Australia. I look forward to the opportunity to talk about why I should be Prime Minister based upon the good things I've done for workers and working constructively with employers. But I was really disappointed yesterday to uh, see in the newspapers that for whatever reason, uh, my former wife uh, has been dragged into some sort of smear campaign. She is a decent person. I think it is... But you said the Royal Commission approached her, right? That's what the reports say. For and what I purpose, do you know? Well, I think it's disgusting. But do you know why they approached her? Well, they obviously were chasing down some smear. But what I would say is it is disgusting. It is unethical. And I don't think there's been too many precedents in Australian politics. She's a decent person and she does not deserve to be dragged into this because of who she was once married to. It's the Royal Commission they're doing its job, isn't it? Well, I think Australians will be the judge of that. I think Australians will be the judge of it. I mean, Barry, have you ever heard of the like being done before? It is becoming habit forming, though, for Labor leaders to be hauled before royal commissions. You'll have a third. Well, it's almost a rite of passage now in a Liberal government. Um, I mean, the Liberal, and I'm not trying to be, make light of it, uh, I am happy to discuss my record. Let me be really clear about that, because I do believe in cooperative workplaces. It doesn't matter if it was at Beaconsfield or professional netballers or factories or shearing sheds or oil rigs. You know, my record stacks up. And if Tony Abbott wants to have a debate about workplace relations and whether or not he as the current Prime Minister or me as the alternative Prime Minister has a better record of standing up for workers, bring it on. On the citizenship.